Uh, we've got an exciting program for you this afternoon. Um, people will be coming on through the afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome those who are on. Um, a little bit of a change of schedule. We have the Attorney General of Pennsylvania um, who's honoring us with a keynote uh, this, uh, this afternoon, uh, Josh Shapiro. Uh, he's going to be calling in momentarily. Uh, he was originally going to be on video with us, but something came up in his office. Uh, so they apologized, um, and but we're very glad to have him uh, as, on the phone. As soon as he comes on, we will put him on. Um, in the meantime, this is, uh, this is Josh Shapiro. If you're waiting on me, I'm here. Uh, there he is. Uh, okay, well, let me quickly introduce um, Mr. Shapiro, who was elected the Attorney General of Pennsylvania in 2016. Uh, he earned his law degree from Georgetown University Law Center at night. Um, while working in a day job as a staffer in the U.S. Congress. Uh, we have his full bio um, on our conference page, along with the agenda uh, for both today and tomorrow's session. Uh, but I'm not going to waste more time in telling everybody about the uh, rules of the road. We'll go, we'll go to that as soon as Mr. Shapiro um, uh, finishes. But I'd like to ask all of you, if you can, to uh, if you have questions, because we do have a compressed time uh, to put your questions into uh, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we will read them off um, once we finish um, having a quick conversation with Mr. Shapiro. So, um, Mr. Shapiro, I'm going to uh, hand the gavel over to you and ask you to, um, uh, to talk, and thanks very much for coming. Well, it's really a pleasure to be with you, and, and thank you so much, Stephen, for the introduction, and I want to thank John Jay College and, of course, the Quattrone Center at Penn, which I'm very familiar with. They do incredible work there, and, and it's been wonderful to partner with them. And to all of the attendees and, and reporters and others uh, who are here today, I want to apologize for not seeing you in person. Um, some issues came up, and I had to uh, run to deal with something else. You'll also notice my voice is a little bit muffled. I'm in a place where I'm wearing a mask, and so I just wanted to sincerely apologize. These issues are incredibly important to me, and so I didn't want to bail on you and and just canceled. So thank you for uh, dealing with me and dealing with these uh, technological hurdles. Look, as the chief uh, law enforcement officer of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I am committed every single day to ensuring a fair and consistent criminal justice system for all, no matter what you look like, where you come from, who you love or who you pray to or choose not to pray to. Uh, I recognize that reforming our criminal justice system is critical. I said that when I was campaigning for this office. I've said it every day since I've been in this office. Whether I'm in a room full of reform advocates or a room full of law enforcement, we need to make sure the system is fair and just for all. There have been moments in our country where we are tragically reminded of just how important accountability and equality in law enforcement is. We saw this, of course, uh, not too long ago, over the summer, uh, when George Floyd was killed under the knee of an officer and under the watchful eye of other officers, officers sworn to protect the public. Too many Americans see that image and see other images on the nightly news and see the rule of law seemingly applying to different people in different ways. And we can't accept that in our system. I have tried to be a leader and a convener here in Pennsylvania. I want to give you an example of that. You know, back uh, about a year ago now, after listening so many times to reform advocates and law enforcement leaders talk to me about these issues, I finally said, we all just need to get together and have a conversation. We got together privately in my office in Harrisburg last October, about a year ago, and in a very emotional and raw and honest conversation, it was clear to me that while there were some areas where there was not going to be agreement, that for the first time ever, these parties were talking to one another, and I was proud to bring them together. And I heard both sides of the conversation say very clearly, we don't want bad police officers, quote unquote, bad police officers in our community. The public didn't want that, and fellow law enforcement leaders didn't want that. And I began working with that group to see if we could find some common ground on that area. In the wake of the killing of Mr. Floyd, uh, we went into overdrive to get something done. I'll fast forward to the end of that hard work. As a result of bringing law enforcement together and reform advocates, legislative black caucus and others, 
Today, Pennsylvania has a statewide database to track police officer misconducts and to make sure that there is transparency in the hiring system and transparency in our policing. That's going to make our community safer and it's going to restore some trust in communities that need it most. Now, the day that I stood with the governor and we signed that, he signed that into law, I also said that I thought this would be a down payment on the kind of progress that we needed to make in our system. And that is something I still believe is true. We need to go beyond that in reforming policing to ban chokeholds, as, as I've done in the Office of Attorney General as a matter of restraint. We need to do other things that are going to make us safer. We need to bring more accountability into the process of not just hiring, but how we train law enforcement. I can speak with direct knowledge the importance of that. In my office, our attorney general's office here in Pennsylvania, unlike others, many others, has criminal jurisdiction. In our office of about a thousand people, we have not just lawyers and professional staff, <clears throat> pardon me, but over 300 agents. We've completely revamped the way agents are trained in our office. Today, they're trained on issues like implicit bias. I want them to understand not just the physical requirements of doing job, the job, but the emotional burdens and requirements as well. I also believe that any law enforcement agency needs to look like the people that we are sworn to serve. And to that end, um, we now boast a diverse a group of agents and a diverse group of leadership within our agent corps. And I think that is a model for other states and certainly other jurisdictions here in Pennsylvania. Training, diversity, that is all very important. Understanding uh, these issues um, and confronting them honestly is going to make us safer and have a more just system. I also believe that we need to use this office to advance criminal, ref excuse me, critical reforms in our criminal justice system ones that understand the root cause of problems. Let me give you a concrete example. I begin the conversation about uh, the, the, the scourge of meth and heroin and fentanyl in our communities by saying every day that drug addiction is a disease, not a crime. And while we certainly won't tolerate people bringing these poisons into our communities and taking advantage of innocent citizens here in Pennsylvania, uh, we need to understand the difference between someone who's peddling these poisons and someone who's battling the disease of addiction. We started in that spirit, the law enforcement treatment initiative uh, about a year and a half ago, partnering with local law enforcement. So now when someone walks into a police station and says, I need help with my addiction, those police officers are now trained to help those individuals access treatment within those uh, within their communities. That's critically important. Another example of how we've not just talked to talk, but walked to walk, there's been a lot of discussion about bail reform across the country. Look, let's be clear, no one should be held in jail awaiting trial just because they can't afford to pay bail, unless of course they're a flight risk or pose a serious danger to their communities. We know that unnecessary pretrial confinement harms defendants, their families and their communities, and it, places an undue burden on the taxpayers within our criminal justice system. Well, a lot of people have talked about it. Uh, we've actually done it. Um, almost two years ago, we passed, or we, we adopted new policies within the AG's office to bring about bail reform. And now our prosecutors are, and agents are directed to seek zero dollars in bail for lower level charges, unless of course, there's extraordinary circumstances that demonstrate a flight risk or a danger to the community. And we're beginning to see more DAs follow this approach here in Pennsylvania and getting some consistency across the Commonwealth. We recognize that justice is about getting it right, uh, not just always securing a conviction. And so my office launched uh, about a year or so ago now, you'll, you'll apologize, I'll apologize. So all of my days kind of blur together. So maybe, maybe 10, 11 months ago, I know the Quattrone Center, we talked to extensively about this before we launched it, um, we launched the first statewide conviction integrity unit to ensure uh, that we get it right. Now, with the, the bifurcated jurisdiction, and in some cases, DAs having exclusive jurisdiction over cases, 
we obviously have to work with our DA partners to bring that about. But I think that having a statewide conviction integrity unit, focusing on getting it right and collaborating um, in law enforcement across the board is, is critically important. Also critically important is making sure our system is working. And when you look at um, our reentry statistics in Pennsylvania, with a recidivism rate of 66%, that is, you know, almost seven out of 10 people leaving jail and prison going back, it's hard to say that the system is working right. And so it's something that I've worked on a long time as a county commissioner, as the head of the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, and now as attorney general. And finally had the ability to create a statewide reentry council to focus on the barriers to reentry, focus on the drivers uh, of recidivism and help people, help our returning citizens get back up on their feet and not end up back in jail. Doing basic things like partnering with PennDOT, which you know runs our uh, driver's licensing and other things here in Pennsylvania to make sure that when someone leaves jail, they have their license and they have all the critical documents that they need partnering with the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency so that before they give tax credits to new um, affordable housing in Pennsylvania, that certain units be set aside for returning citizens. Because we know that we can bring the recidivism rate down if people have a roof over their head. Making sure that you leave prison not only with your meds, but that you also leave with a treatment plan and access to physicians and other services that you may need. We know that is going to help reduce our recidivism rate. I also want to make quick mention of the fact that as the attorney general, uh, I sit um, and I'm constitutionally mandated to do this. I sit on our board of pardons and commutations, a five member board where we've made a number of improvements to the process to give people second chances. Um, we are allowing more and more people to access the process by eliminating the application fee and streamlining and digitizing the application process. I'm proud uh, to note that on the commutations, that's the side where uh, we grant commutations or recommend that commutations be granted to lifers. Um, I have voted in favor of more commutations than all attorneys general in the history of Pennsylvania combined. I believe in second chances and I believe that we can um, strike that balance between public safety and second chances. And I think we need to go even further. Um, it requires a unanimous five nothing vote in order to recommend to the governor that a sentence be commuted. Um, I have endorsed the idea and endorsed legislation that would change it to a simple three to two majority vote so we can get more of these cases on the desk of the governor. Look, there is a lot more work that needs to be done across the country. There's a lot more work that I know you all are involved in, and I truly thank you for being on the front lines of this movement. Um, we, you know, we know that we are living today with the consequences of slavery and racism. It's been institutionalized over generations in many aspects of our society. I know I spent most of my time here talking about the criminal justice system, but we can't ignore the way that's been institutionalized in our healthcare system, in our economy, in our schools. Um, and that is something that we all need to be very honest and open and direct about. We move forward in this process. Look, my, uh, my faith teaches me, uh, and I think this is a, a fairly universal understanding, that no one is required to complete the task, uh, but neither are we free to refrain from it. Um, recognizing that each of us has a responsibility to get off the sidelines, to get in the game and to do our part. And that no one individual can bring about equality alone, but we each have to do our part. Attorneys general, advocates, professors, the media in responsibly reporting on these issues, all of that uh, is required to bring about a more fair and just system. And I'm proud to do my part and proud to be here with you today. And I wish uh, we could be in person. So of course, I, I wish you all good um, health and, and safety uh, along the way. So thank you so much. And I got about a, a minute or two more if there's um, any questions uh, or any other topics you want me to jump into, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Well, thank you, Attorney General. And in fact, we do have a number of questions that are already on our screen. So I was going to move to um, some of them very quickly. Um, we have one, um, and I'll, it's a long question. Um, uh, it's a question about civil asset forfeiture. Um, 
handful of states have gotten rid of the practice, saying that police and prosecutors couldn't seize property until someone is charged with a criminal right. act. And he says whenever we report on this, the public is generally angry to learn that state police, and specifically our office, take money from people who have never been issued a ticket or charged with a crime during traffic stops. So I wonder if you want to comment on that. Sure. I'll, I'll hit it really quick just in the interest of time. So the, the question is slightly wrong in terms of my office taking it. I want to be clear. Under our state law, we are the administrators of it, the attorney general's offices. We don't do traffic stops. It's not within our purview, but we will manage those funds once they have been uh, seized by state police or, or otherwise. Um, we also conduct our own reviews of those cases to make sure uh, that it was handled in a just manner. More broadly, let me be very clear what my position is. While there was some reform back in 2017, 18 here in Pennsylvania, we need to go much, much further uh, and limit this practice even more. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to move to Emily, um, our assistant, who's got a bunch of the questions on her screen. Emily, can you read out the ones you see? Because I can't see them on mine. Yes, sure. So I have a question from Eric from the Butler Eagle. Um, he said, you mentioned police reform, but local police departments, like in Butler County, have been resistant to reform because they don't have the money to do all of the training that some of the reforms require. He was wondering if there's any push to address local or municipal police departments aside from just state police. Absolutely. There, there needs to be a real focus on that. These departments, we have 1,200 law enforcement agencies in Pennsylvania, including some that are pretty small and, and severely underfunded. And I think that um, there needs to be a focus on consolidation. Uh, I just endorsed a proposal in Allegheny County, for those of you not familiar, that's in the Pittsburgh area, um, for consolidation. There needs to be more consolidation uh, and increased funds so that there's, there's not a reliance on line items that don't end up actually helping pursue justice. There needs to be greater uniformity in training uh, and we are doing everything in our power to lead. I don't, as the Attorney General of Pennsylvania, oversee municipal police departments, but certainly we can support and assist them along the way. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question. This one's from Lori, and she was wondering if you could speak on your stance on the legalization of recreational marijuana in Pennsylvania. Um, what effect do you believe that will have on crime? I spent a great deal of time studying that issue and talking to attorneys general, governors in other states to understand the, the impact on, say, DUIs and, and uh, you know, child, children using it, what have you, and announced, I would say maybe a year, year and a half ago now, um, my support for legalization with one important caveat, that I would only be for a bill if it included the expungement of records of people with convictions for possessing small amounts of marijuana uh, in the past. We know that it has negatively impacted our you know, black and brown neighbors um, at a disproportionately high rate, higher rate, pardon me, than uh, our white neighbors. And we've got to make sure that any package to um, regulate and tax it needs to include that criminal justice reform piece with it as well and guarantee the expungement, uh, guarantee the process for an expungement. Great, right, thank you. Um, and then uh, one last question, um, if you still have the time. Uh, you'd spoken a little bit about diversity and inclusion um, within your department. Uh, recent press conferences announce um, indictments are often predominant. sorry, announcing indictments are often predominantly white. What are the current racial makeups of your department? And that's from- Sure. I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to speak over you. No, you're fine. Okay, sorry, we had a little bit of a delay there. Um, the, one of the first things I did was um, create the position of a diversity and inclusion director within the Office of Attorney General. Hired a wonderful woman named Ebony Caldwell. Our diversity is our strength. Um, our inclusion is our strength. We have more women in positions of leadership than men in the Office of Attorney General today. Um, within our agents specifically, I believe that was the, the question. There are four people who are um, considered command staff. That, that is the four leaders of our agent corps. Um, and two of them are African-American and two are white. Um, we are improving uh, 
the diversity, it's, it's better than ever before, but I also recognize that um, we all still have to uh, strive for greater equality and, and we're gonna continue to do that work. Um, so I gotta jump, but I thank you all so very much uh, for having me uh, today. And I wish I could at least see you through a Zoom screen, but salute the work you're doing and appreciate you very, very much. Thank you, Attorney General. We do appreciate your time. Um, we'll move on to the rest of the program, but thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Okay, we're going to move now to a little bit of the program uh, first. Um, I want to start off, um, first of all, explaining to you a little bit about what we're doing uh, today and tomorrow. Um, for those of you who didn't hear me at the, at the first of the, um, this is at the kickoff of the session, uh, we have an agenda and uh, bios of all our speakers uh, on our conference page. Uh, Emily will put again the link that you can take a look at it. Um, we're going to start uh, pretty much um, tomorrow, the same time as we did today, and we'll be going on both days till about 4 p.m. I want to first uh, just bring on um, our staff, uh, Chris Graham, uh, who's our technical advisor, to give you some of the rules of the road. Uh, you've already met. Um, Emily Riley, who's our uh, intern, who's been working on the system. So, um, Chris, over to you for a few moments. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I just want to point out that we're going to be posting information throughout the webinars uh, in the chat, uh, further information with links and, and uh, further reading. And we just encourage you to send all of your questions in through the Q&A feature. That's at the bottom of your screen. Just hover at the bottom, click on the Q&A feature, and um, send your questions in that way. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. So the, the purpose of these regional uh, justice webinars are really, um, we started out when we were still in the pre-COVID times as live conferences. And the idea was to bring together journalists from specific areas where specific states and regions, where there's a lot of movement going on uh, in terms of uh, criminal justice reform, uh, or not, as the case may be, where there were problems. And we wanted to look at separate special states and help journalists um, get a little bit deeper and have a little bit of deeper dive into some of the issues involved. We've done uh, a regional workshop so far in Florida um, and Texas. Uh, this is our third one. Um, in Pennsylvania, we'll be having another one in Wisconsin and another one at the beginning of the year with Arizona. They are going to be um, online, of course, now that it's COVID times, but uh, the point of it is the same, to uh, give journalists a particular uh, some of the basic knowledge, contacts, and resources uh, that they need to go, go a little bit further on stories uh, that relate to criminal justice or juvenile justice and all the issues. There's no, I don't need to say that it's the top of the agenda, uh, both nationally and on the state level. And we hope what we provide you uh, will give you some basis for going further and developing good projects. Uh, we're open to your questions um, and your um, ideas and stories as well throughout the course of this webinar and beyond. Um, the webinar is recorded, it's all on the record, and we will have a, as soon as the recording is uploaded and available, we will uh, provide the link to you. Um, but I wanna also thank um, a few of the folks who helped make this possible. Uh, the Charles Koch Foundation uh, has been helping us with these, um, all of these regional workshops, and um, We've been doing them in cooperation with uh, specific institutions and universities in each of the areas. And in Pennsylvania, we're particularly indebted to the Quattrone Center uh, for the Fair Administration of Justice, uh, whose director is John Holway. And I wanted to bring John up, uh, first of all, to say a few words of welcome. Uh, John? Thanks, Steve. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, well, I guess, to be here in that sort of video Zoom sense of here. We had hoped, obviously, to host everybody at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but uh, thrilled that you guys are still doing this through Zoom, and it's just really vitally important to have these conversations. So we're uh, excited to be part of it um, and to and to assist in any way we can. I think in you know the, the Quattro Center uh, takes what we call a systems approach to improving quality in the criminal justice system, and we try to look at all parts of the criminal justice system: uh, police, prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, and others. Uh, corrections as well, and look at how they intersect and ways that we can create change uh, that will really last and, and improve the ability of the system to keep people safe, but also to make sure that we are uh, arresting the right people for crimes and not uh, participating in uh, wrongful convictions or things like civil forfeiture that might bias the proceedings or things like that. So in times like these with 
criminal justice reform, racial justice, social justice at the absolute uh, peak of social interest and importance, the role that the people watching this webinar play in communicating uh, real accurate information in ways that are objective and, and data driven to our communities is vital to make sure that uh, the people who vote and the people who protest are doing so uh, in knowledgeable and thoughtful ways. And we just really appreciate your role, Steve, the role of the center uh, and the role of all the journalists participating in making sure that our, our Pennsylvania discourse and our national discourse on these essential issues is well informed. Uh, and we look forward to helping you uh, in any way we can going forward. Uh, thank you, John. I'm sure the journalists will take you up at your word and they'll be coming back to you with some ideas and requests for help. Um, I also want to bring up uh, um, Kenny Gray, who is our journalism coordinator. Most of you know her. Uh, her bio as well is on the on our uh, conference page. She's a contributing editor for the Crime Report and the coordinator for, for most of our regional justice reporting workshops and a Pulitzer Prize winner as well. Uh, she's your point person uh, for any questions you might have and any issues uh, that you need in terms of research. So, uh, Kenny, uh, if you're listening, if you want to come on and say a few words. Sure, I am listening. Um, at Chris, uh, my video is, you have to hit me up. At any rate, good morning. I am so glad that y'all are here. Uh, these are important stories. As Steve said, I am your point person, your resource. Um, if you uh, need studies, national perspective, sources, um, I'm here and available for you for your work. Um, of, of course, there's national context for this and they're state by state. Um, and I can provide you some of that. I'm glad y'all are here. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. As you see behind her is a logo of the Crime Report, which is what we put out um, every day as our uh, news and resource link. And I wanted to add that when you do your stories, the stories that you do as a result of this uh, seminar and other ones that you do on criminal justice, we'll be glad to post them or cross post them simultaneously. Uh, many of you who have been fellows in our other programs um, know the drill. Uh, just let us know when you, when you do post a story on your own outlet or you have a story to run and send us the link and we'll be very glad to uh, highlight it um, for our national leadership. Um, there's a lot of meat to talk about. Uh, you know, I don't know if we're gonna be able to cover it all in two days, even with four hour sessions. Uh, we understand that many of you have other uh, busy schedules. So while it's not uh, absolutely obligatory to be at every single session uh, through the webinar, we hope you will. Uh, as I say, the um, uh, webinar is being recorded. Um, and those of you who've signed up as journalists uh, will be told, uh, be informed when we have a link available to upload. Um, it's a packed program, I think a really stimulating program. Um, we're looking at police, we're looking at police reform, uh, some of the things that the AG talked about uh, this afternoon, we'll be looking at race and justice, uh, all the issues that are really both nationally important and obviously important uh, for Pennsylvania. Uh, so we're going to take a, uh, a short break now before we move on to our next panel, uh, which is a, a conversation I hope that will interest you on uh, reform and justice, uh, looking at it from the other side, from people who've been there. Uh, so we're going to go off um, line for a few moments and then come back again at promptly at 12.50. Thank you both.